So I'll start with hooray beer. So medieval art, collective intelligence, and language abuse. Today we're going to discuss medieval art, collective intelligence, cloud computing, literature, and language abuse. This is, in actuality, a cloud computing free presentation. You may buy me a beer later and thanks. So let's start at the very beginning, which is, in fact, a very good place to start. Basho. Basho is a distributed systems company. A distributed systems company with a distributed team. And as a member of this distributed team, I've learned many things, but one in particular. Software is all about humans. Let's start with language abuse. The year was 1873, and a young college student was appointed as the assistant librarian at Amherst College. This man, Melville Lewis Cosseth Dewey, became frustrated with categorization inside the library, and in an attempt to increase the utility of the library without increasing expenditure, he created a method of classification, the Dewey Decimal System. The system was devised solely for cataloging and indexing purposes, but he found it to be equally valuable for arranging books on shelves. Interestingly, or perhaps frighteningly, he also became enamored with the concept of simpler spelling or English language spelling reform, which is responsible for the spelling of catalog instead of catalog, do it your fault, we're so sorry. This also prompted a desire to change his name to Melville Dewey. <laughs> and most disturbingly, responsible for menus in the local area reading haddock, potted beef with noodles, parsley or mashed potato, butter, steamed rice, lettuce, and ice cream. So that's <laughs> Exactly. A hierarchical system of categorization that led to a measure of absurdity. Collective intelligence. 1906 London, this man, Francis Galton, visited a livestock fair where a contest would demonstrate collective intelligence. An ox was on display and villagers, farmers, ranchers, doctors, men, women, children, professionals, laborers, basically all of the townspeople were invited to guess the weight of the ox after slaughter. There were 787 guesses. None of them were right. However, the mean of the guesses was 1,197 pounds, the actual weight, wait for it, 1,198 pounds. Francis Galton said, the result seems more creditable to the trustworthiness of a democratic judgment. With that said, this came from a man who was earlier steeped in the study of anthropometry, which is the systematic quantitative representation of the human body for use in classification and comparison, in which the sum of his research indicated that people are idiots. And only the quote, and this is a quote, select well-bred few should control society. Collective intelligence. If you're familiar with the field of artificial intelligence, you may know of the collective intelligence quotient, which measures the marginal extra intelligence that's added by each new individual that participates in the collective. It's a notional mathematical metric to ensure a system does not succumb to groupthink. Language abuse is a phenomenon that also occurs in mathematics. 
to quote, we have made a particular effort to always use rigorously correct language without sacrificing simplicity. As far as possible, we have drawn attention in the text to abuses of language without which any mathematical text runs the risk of pedantry, not to say unreadability. I'm often asked how things like GitHub issues, HipChat, Campfire, IRC, and a myriad of other tools enable a distributed team to function, enable open source communities to leverage the collective intelligence of a community of engineers. The question usually sounds something like, Tyler, what is your perspective on communication tools and methodologies in distributed teams? My perspective? <laughs> well, you asked. But first, a brief foray, foray pardon me, into literature. Charles Lutwidge Dodson. Does anybody know him? Good, some hands. He's perhaps best known under a pseudonym. He wrote a tale. It was a tale of fantasy. It had allusions to his friends. It was a tale that plays with logic and that I have loved since a young age. Charles Lutwidge Dodson was groomed as an Anglican priest. He refused to take his priestly orders. He was a migraineur. He suffered from seizures. He spoke with a stammer, and he was accused of pedophilia. This man, Lewis Carroll, author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, to me, is an apt description of most technologists. Cheshire Puss, Alex began, rather timidly, as she did not at all know whether it would like the name. However, it only grinned a little wider. Come, it's pleased so far, thought Alice, and she went on. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. Oh, I don't care much where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat if you only walk long enough. But I don't want to go among mad people, Alice remarked. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. Then it doesn't much matter which way you go, because we're all mad here. In 1884, a science fiction novella was published to lambast the social hierarchy of Victorian culture, Flatland. According to Isaac Asimov, this is the best introduction one can find into the manner of perceiving dimensions. It is, in essence, an imagining of a two-dimensional square experiencing life in a one-dimensional world and interacting with a three-dimensional being. If that sounds brain-breaking and you haven't read it, start now. The Sphere says, but now. Prepare to receive proof positive of the truth of my assertions. You can at least see that as I rise in space, so my sections become smaller. See now, I will rise and the effect upon your eye will be that my circle will become smaller and smaller till it, till it dwindles to a point and finally vanishes. Something like this. And the square with whom he was conversing said, there was no rising that I could see, but he diminished and finally vanished. I winked once or twice to make sure that I was not dreaming. But it was no dream. It was no dream. Medieval art. Medieval art is a heavily religious form of art that's focused on groups of symbols rather than a coherent picture. The difference between this famous piece of art and this famous piece of art is perspective. Perspective is defined as an approximate representation on a flat surface, such as paper, of an image as it is perceived by the eye. Perspective was likely used first in the 5th century BC by ancient Gre or in ancient Greece where 
two philosophers worked on geometric theories of perspective for use on stage panels. But as happens in mathematics, the modern resurgence came in 1415, when this man, Filippo Brunelleschi, demonstrated the methods of perspective by painting the outlines of various buildings around Florence onto a mirror. In essence, he was copying a reflection of real life, and he was realizing that it was, in fact, beautiful. Perspective. Thus, through perspective, every sort of confusion is revealed within us. And this is that weakness of the human mind on which the art of conjuring and of deceiving by light and shadow and other ingenious devices imposes, having an effect upon us like magic. And the art of measuring and numbering and weighing come to the rescue of human understanding. There is the beauty of them and the apparent greater or less or more or heavier no longer have the mastery over us but give way before calculation and measure and weight according to Plato. Perspective is the essence of showing things as they appear not as they are. So what does that mean? I'll give you an example. These creep me out. <laughs> no, seriously, they are going to eat me, and they are evil, 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 and my wife loves them, and I am horrified of butterflies, so arguably I have a flawed perspective. So people ask me, Tyler, what is your perspective on communication tools and methodologies and distributed teams? What is the reality about communication and technology? I am asked about tools for communication. You want to know my perspective? Perhaps flawed? My view of our present reality is that I should instead be asked about people. Because software is all about humans. We, as an industry, may, in our attempt to streamline communication across disparate geographies, end up with simpler spelling. A series of in-jokes, of memes, problem, and catchphrases get on this level that serve, we think, to build community. But perhaps they exclude participation because software is all about humans. My perspective, perhaps flawed, is that we are not Alice stumbling about Wonderland. Is that we are not a two-dimensional being struggling to understand reality. My perspective is that the perceived and real ethos of technology can change to include, to invite, to enable broad participation. How? We've discussed some of it in the last conversation. But it's another talk entirely. But, the process starts with a simple challenge that our perspective may no longer be a reflection of reality. Our perspective may be flawed and we discover this flawed perspective only by listening. I'll repeat that. We discover this flawed perspective only by listening. Because software is all about humans. In my life, there are humans. Humans I work for, humans I work with, humans who work 
for me, humans I raise, like Gabriella Larit Hannon, who's age six, like Aoife Liron Hannon and her rad pink hat that's age two. And these two little humans may make me a futurist, but these two little humans are the future engineers, should they so choose. Tyler, what is your perspective on communication tools and methodologies in distributed teams? It's not about the tools. It is about the people and how we in this room today choose to interact. How we who are in this room today choose to listen even when it's uncomfortable. How we choose to broaden our perspective because after all, software is all about humans. That's 372 slides. It's of course with apologies to Lawrence Lessig and Rolf Skyber. It's written while listening to explosions in the sky, some beautiful bombazine black and Nathaniel Rateliff. That's me. And if you have questions or want to talk about it, I'm happy to. <laughs>